Hey, good Thursday morning, everybody. Welcome into the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast. I'm Eric Kane, alongside Matt Ray, Rob Lewis, and Brent Hubbs. Big thanks, as always, to our friends, Exterior Home Solutions, 865-524-5888. Give them a, a, a call for a free estimate or check them out online at exteriorhomesolutions.com. Got a full bank of questions here to get into for the mailbag uh, edition of the podcast. Won't get to them all, but we'll do our best to work through as many as we can. We will start with Nash Vol 615. Do you feel Hypo and company have been able to adequately, adequately capture recruiting moment from the 2022 Orange Bowl season? Feels like a massive missed opportunity. So we'll start with that one first, Brent. How, how would you kind of respond to that? Oh, I mean, I think we probably overthought what the what the impact of the Orange Bowl game, Orange Bowl win would be for, for Tennessee. I mean, that class was already done. And you talk about moving forward. They got a bunch of guys on campus. Um, I, I just don't think a lot of a lot of players and prospects went. Wow, I, I'm I'm all into Tennessee because they won the Orange Bowl. Now I thought Nico would have a greater impact in recruiting in terms of um, you know the high profile uh, of and, and his ranking and everything. I thought there would be a greater impact there. I think it was probably a little bit of an overestimation to the impact of the the Orange Bowl win. It, itself in, in that in that game um but yeah i mean probably a little bit surprised but not like oh my gosh they've utterly failed in recruiting well and i would add and matt you can you can speak to this because you i mean you know more about it me but it's not like you know you're still recruiting against georgia and alabama you know those are your border states and your biggest i mean where'd they go i mean you know georgia was ranked number one all year long bama's in the college football it's you know it's not like your biggest competition fell off the map yeah, no, it's not that way. And I think more so than anything, and this isn't just the case with Tennessee, but you're seeing kids pick, you know, schools that are not Georgia and Alabama all the time. Now, obviously, those two are still at the top of the recruiting rankings there. But I think there's beginning to be more parity in college football. There's beginning to be more parity in recruiting just because of the, the landscape of things. And I, I agree with Brent. I think probably overestimated a little bit the impact that the you know Orange Bowl win would have. Um, you know, but Tennessee was able to get a lot of kids to campus in January and in the spring. And, you know, it certainly felt like a lot of misses for sure. But I just think things are spacing out a little more across the board right now in, in college football and college football recruiting. Nashville 615 goes on to ask, AP has talked about Tennessee having the strongest NIL offer in many cases, but still falling to close, uh, falling close in recruiting battles. Are the recruiting chops of the assistant coaches lacking? And if so, is this fixable, Matt? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think a lot of times these recruitments come down to different things nowadays, right, Brent? I mean, everybody wants to point and, and you know, make it seem like it's NIL and, and that's it because that's the new thing and it's the easiest thing to point at. It comes down to a variety of things. If you have, you know, the better NIL offer – but you don't have some pro production to point out behind it and a relationship with that coach. You know, if, if it's me, I'm, I'm going to the place that I feel like can get me to where I ultimately want to go. You're going to have some kids in, in this day and age that go to where the NIL offer is the best. It's just going to be what it is. But, you know, overall, I think you have to stack up that success on the field and, and in the NFL draft production. And, and I think that some of Tennessee has to continue to improve upon, um, you know, continue to build relationships and have a little bit bigger board in terms of recruiting as well at certain positions, especially. Yeah. And I think when you talk about NIL, I mean, it's one thing if you're going to be able to, if your NIL deal is going to be uh, substantially larger than the other team's NIL deal, then then NIL might be the deciding factor. But that's yeah. just not going to be the case with a bunch of really good players out there all the time. It, there's going to end up that it's going to be within the – within the ballpark of each other, okay? We were splitting hairs over maybe a few thousand dollars here or, or or something like that. So when that's the case, what does it get back to? Robbie gets back to the relationships. It get, I mean, you got you still got to recruit them like you recruited them 10 years ago. You just have a different variable that has to be in there because when it comes out that it's pretty much even financially, it, it goes back to where you feel most comfortable. And I think Tennessee's youth in some of their some of their coaching spots, youth in recruiting, ha has shown up some. Um, I think this is I think the SEC is hard to to, to learn how to recruit in. I, I think it's a tough conference for that to be your training ground. 
um, you know, when, when you're trying to stack up against the teams that you're going against. All right, we'll go to Sam Smith, 2233. He's got a couple of questions here. In the age of portal, will we see teams stop recruiting high school quarterbacks and uh, just get older guys out of the portal? Rob, uh, you're never going to not recruit high school quarterbacks, but if your development's not where you want to be on the roster, I mean, that transfer portal is such a great band-aid to go out and get a difference maker at the quarterback position. And, uh, you know, potentially they could be there for a couple of years, but especially just as a bridge, that portal's helped a lot of teams. Yeah, I think – what you might see, uh, you I completely agree. You're never going to stop recruiting high school quarterbacks, but you might not reach for a kid, um, you know, in in December or, or January that 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 you're not sure about. When you, you know, let's wait and see what's at, what's in the portal in April. That's where I think you'll see the the impact if when you're talking about that position specifically. Yeah, Sam Smith, twenty two thirty three, also goes on asking me about Zane Denton. Is the plan still for him to join the team in January? Uh, that has always been the plan. The plan is always to have Zane Denton with Tennessee for the season. Um, he was not with the team in the fall. Um, so until I see him there, you know, it's kind of one of those see it to believe it's, but uh, that that's always been the plan. And of course, we'll update you if anything else comes out from that. Finally here, besides DJ Burns, anyone from the fighting Wolf Pack that will cause a problem for Tennessee on Saturday night? Uh, yeah, they got a couple of good transfer guards. Uh, upperclassman Jaden Taylor is a transfer from Butler. Um Really sharp shooter. He's he's actually their leading scorer over DJ right at 15, 14, 15 a game, and uh, he's been shooting the eyes out early. He didn't didn't take a ton of threes, but he's making almost fifty percent. And uh, DJ Horn, another guard uh, transfer. I think he's from Arizona State, but that's another another older guy that transferred in. Uh, smaller guard, but also he a, a guy that that will get up a get up a bunch of threes. So pretty pretty. Two guys in the backcourt to watch out, Jaden Taylor, DJ Horn, a pair of transfer guards, and obviously DJ Burns. And I was just looking at NC State's NC State stats uh earlier just to you know start doing some work. And DJ's playing 29 minutes a game. That that wow caught me way off guard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, maybe they're not pushing tempo too much. Yeah, up I, I, school, I, would say, I would say there's a good chance of that. <laughs> hey, Eric, I want to go back to, to, to Sam's first question when he was asked about recruiting the high school quarterback. Or not? I think that's an interesting topic and an interesting discussion because I think for the power five, for the elite power five teams, Matt, that have NIL dollars and some availability, I think you're going to see the elite quarterbacks continue to be heavily recruited and go from there. I think what's interesting is if you're Dave Clawson, if you're Dave Doran, and schools at places where it doesn't appear that the NIL um, that that their NIL funding and their NIL plan is as concrete as it is at some of the elite places. I think that's an interesting decision for them because do you want to take a high school kid, Matt, that plays a couple of years, a little bit of a training ground, and they leave you like Riley Leonard's doing at Duke. I know coaching change there, but we saw Sam Hartman at Wake Forest. We yep. see the Morris kid at NC State leaving. Are, are you better off if you're NC State that you go back and you get a transfer portal quarterback who doesn't land at one of those elite places like they just got today from the kid from, from Coastal Carolina. I think those schools, which don't have the deep pockets in the NIL world, I think they may have to make different decisions in, high, in recruiting quarterbacks out of high school versus the transfer portal. Yeah, I think that's very interesting too, and I agree with you, Brent. I think that's where you're going to see – some shift in terms of the high school quarterbacks. I think you'll see the programs, you know, the major power five programs continue to recruit those elite guys because you, you, you can't miss on them. You can't let that guy go, you know, to a potentially lesser conference foe and, and eat you alive for a couple of years before you get ready to go somewhere else. So you're going to continue to recruit those guys, but I, I think it makes the dynamic very interesting. I, to me, look at Kentucky, right? We've seen Kentucky take Will Levis. We've seen Kentucky take Devin Leary. It felt very apparent they would take a transfer portal quarterback again this cycle. They did so with Brock Vandegrift, but at the same time, they're bringing in Cutter Bowley, who was originally a 2025. He'll reclass. He'll come in in 2024, and you're able to get your hands on him a little bit longer. So I think in terms of that side of things, you'll see those schools take more developmental guys maybe, but you know, long term, I, I do think it will shift a little bit for some of those schools like you mentioned to – the transfer portal guy that's been at Coastal Carolina, that's been at Troy with an up-and-coming coach and can come in and make an impact for one year and, and go on out the door. 
Let's go next to Athrun. Do you think taking a wide receiver in the portal would turn into losing one of Nimrod or Webb to the portal, Brent? I don't think so uh, at this point. I mean, I think if you're a, I think if you're a kid who's given a lot of credence to going in the portal, I, I think I think your window for going in that portal is in in the early period is closing pretty quickly here, right? I mean, I, it was a thirty day window, and we're. Yeah. We're, we're halfway over halfway through it. I know there'll be a few guys go in here and there, but but I, I think if you have visions of going in the portal now, you, you need to you need to already be there and, and get to work on on kind of where you are because there's a ton of guys going in the portal and you don't want to get left out in the cold, so to speak. Going in the portal in the springtime window is really challenging because it means you can't go to another SEC school. Um, that's not to say there won't be some movement in the portal in the spring, but that spring window is going to be really um, low key compared to what we're seeing right now. So my, my initial answer to that question is no, I don't see anybody making a move there at the same time too. You, you, you know, you never say never, but I've not heard any rumblings of those guys being upset and, and Tennessee's got to go get a portal receiver. I mean, they, they, they have to, they just don't have enough bodies scholarship bodies there to overcome an injury or deal with injuries with where they're at. I mean, they are super thin going into this bowl game and they haven't lost anybody to the portal because they've been super thin to close out the regular season with where they are. Um, and they don't, you know, they don't have them lined up coming in out of high school uh, in terms of a deep number of guys there. So a portal receiver makes some sense. I mean, you're an injury away in the slot to having Chaz Nemrod play the slot. Um, you're an injury away from probably having Jack Jansen come in and play wide receiver um there's it's pretty thin right now so in terms of the bodies you're exactly right i think that's um you, you need to your board needs to be wider from the from the prep level to bring in more wide receivers because you just you lost a lot last year too with both jimmy's going to the portal walker merrill going to the portal and you haven't really replenished that and you got a couple of good ones coming in as well uh we'll get one more before we hit the reset z rob 023 wants to know if rodney garner is going to have a signing day surprise this year like he has in the past you know, I mean, the hope is Dominic McKinley, right? I mean, at the end of the day, that's that's the guy that's kind of surfaced here late. Turnover at Texas A&M opened the door for several schools, and they're trying to keep their foot in the door. And it seems like he's probably going to wait until the, you know, February signing day to do something, which gives Tennessee a chance to get him on campus. Tennessee still has Josh Heupel's in-home visit with him, so I think that's something that's working in their favor. They saw him earlier in the week. Um, by all accounts, that's a visit that I think and have heard went very well. So we'll see where things go there. But, again, that's a – you know, Texas a and is going to try to hang on. They're going to try to have a splash, obviously, with, with Mike Elko coming in. Texas is involved. Oklahoma's involved. I don't think Oklahoma's quite as confident um, that they weren't very confident the first time around, but they're still trying to be involved. He's a Louisiana kid. LSU is involved. And then Syracuse is obviously the, the new staff. Uh, you have Elijah Robinson. You have Nick Williams. They're trying to get some juice going up there. He knows both of those guys very well. I'm committed to Robinson at, at Texas A&M. So they're, they're working in there too. So that's one that, you know, while there's some things working in Tennessee's favor, we'll see where it goes. You have to get him here in January for an official, and you just have to, you know, continue to push there. But, yeah, I mean, I think there's a chance with Dominic McKinley. But outside of that, I don't see any other signing day, potential signing day surprises at this point. Do you, Brent? No, I don't at, at this point in time. And I think you got a pretty clear base of, of where you are and, and, and kind of – what things look like for you at this point. But um, I, I don't think there's any just out of the blue, uh, you know, unless somebody sneaks in this weekend, you know, some prep kid sneaks in this weekend and, and kind of tries to fly under the radar. Uh, those are just harder and harder to do in, in this day and age. So I, I'd, I'd be surprised if that were the case. We'll come back, answer more of your mailbag questions, but first a uh, quick word from Exterior Home Solutions. It's one of those phone calls that you hate to get from your kids. Hey dad, a tree fell on my house. Well, we got that call a couple of weeks back from our daughter at her house here. And the first call that I made was to Exterior Home Solutions. The peace of mind that they gave me and us as a family when they came out here and came up with a plan, got us connected with the right people is absolutely priceless. Use the same people that I use. In that time of need, Exterior Home Solutions. 
As always, a big time thank you to our friends, Exterior Home Solutions. We're going to get back to the Mailbag Podcast here in just a moment, but I want to welcome Grant Ramey on in, and uh, we're going to do a little, our, uh, our prize pick segment. If you listen to Game Quest throughout the football season, you know kind of the direction we're going to go in here for the next couple of minutes. But if you don't know what prize picks is, let me tell you what it is. It's, it's a whole lot of fun. We've had a blast playing prize picks throughout the college football season, and you know you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry over at Price Picks. You put in the promo code VQ and you're also going to you're also going to receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. So if I've been at $100 in my first deposit, Price Packs is going to match me $100 as well. How does Price Picks work? Well, it's basically projections. You pick between 2 to 6 players, any sports, any leagues, and Price Picks is going to offer their projections and all you're going to do is we're going to pick more than or less than. It's simple as that. And again, if yours hits two to five players, you can win 25 times your money back on any entry. So uh, let's go ahead and go through our price picks here for this week. And Grant Ramey's had a lot of success throughout the year picking these. Um, I wish we would have kept track, but here we go. Let's go to the college football playoff. Still obviously a couple of weeks away, but let's look at that 1-4 matchup, Michigan and Alabama. Let's go quarterbacks. Grant Ramey, J.J. McCarthy in the college football playoff semifinal. Is he going to throw for more than or less than 188.5? You said to start this thing, uh, you know where this might be going if you listen to the Game Quest podcast. They, yes, they certainly know which way it's going. But I'm, <laughs> I'm about to leave Corso Okie doke and go uh, no, uh, less than 188.5. I, I wow. Mark McCarthy seems like a great quarterback and perfect for that Michigan team, but it, I don't. Maybe I'm crazy or just not keeping up with Michigan football closely enough, but it seems like his numbers aren't huge every week. Like he doesn't have to do a ton to make them a great football team. So no disrespect to McCarthy, JJ McCarthy, but I'll, I'll go with less than 188 and a half. Wow. So starting off with a little bit of an upset, great Ramey picks, picks a less than JJ McCarthy, 188.5. And again, great run game, great defense. Um, he really is a, a great quarterback just to compliment a great football team. Let's go on the other side. Jalen Milrow, two, uh, we know about his uh, dangerous ability on the ground as well. He's gotten better as the year's gone on. Milrow, price picks, projects him at 205.5 passing yards. You going more than or less than? Back on the saddle. You think I'm going less than two times in a row, more than. Uh, Michigan's going to have to stop uh, Jalen Milrow from running. Uh, they're going to have to contain him a little bit. Jalen's pretty good at hitting that deep ball. Uh, he's going to have to make some big plays to to win this football game if Alabama's going to advance more. Let's go to the other semifinal game, the two versus three. Let's go Washington, Michael Penix, Quinn Ewers of Texas. Um, quarterbacks here, let's go Ewers first. And it's 290, 290.5. Quinn Ewers, more than or less than against Washington in the college football playoff semifinal. More than. Give me a shootout. More than. It's got to be. I want a 52 49 uh, last. Whoever got the ball last wins a football game. Give me more. And arguably the best quarterback in all the college football playoffs this year. Probably won't have the best pro career. Arguably could have been the Heisman Trophy winner this year. That is Michael Penix Jr. Tennessee fans know that name very well. But for Washington, 310 passing yards in the hook. So 310.5. If you want a shootout with Quinn Ewers, I would imagine you're going to go more than. How do you know? How do you know that? How, I mean, how do you read my mind? Are you are you Oz the Mentalist? Uh, yes, more than because he's not going to run it, so he's going to have to throw it. Um, more than because, I, like I said, I want that shootout. And I, I started less than. Um, new year, new me. I had a couple weeks off. No, right back on the saddle with three more. So, yeah, more. <laughs> I do think that uh, Alabama-Michigan is going to be a lower-scoring game. Both those teams can score plenty. I mean, we saw L- – we saw – Alabama have to outscore LSU. We saw Alabama come from down 13 against Tennessee. I mean, we know they can score, but I see that game being a little bit low scoring, and I'm with you, man. At least I'm hoping Texas and Washington just a complete shootout, and I hope both those guys get over those totals. And uh, if you do as well and you pick more than, you could win up to 25 times your money back. If you're watching on YouTube right now, you can see uh, this is how it looks right now. We're going to pick four to players, but you can go. you have to have at least two. You can go up to as many as six, and here are the projections. All you do is pick more than or less than what this projection is right here. So all that and more is at pricepicks.com, and if you put in that promo code VQ, you're going to get a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. All that and more, that's at pricepicks.com. 
All right, let's jump back into the mailbag questions. We'll go to Oregon Vol. How do you guys see the transfer portal evolving over the next few cycles? I know money isn't the lone reason players jump into the portal, but I wonder if we start seeing an elevated number of players going in that might have missed out on big NIL opportunities coming out of high school. Uh, Brent, you want to take a first stab at it? Uh, I think that you're going to probably see a little bit less of that because – Right now, what you're dealing with is a bunch of veteran guys who NIL wasn't in place when they were coming out of high school. So they're dealing with the fact that some guys who are underneath them um, on the depth chart have money and they don't have money. So I think that's why you see some of the veteran guys making some of the moves um, that, that, you're, that you're seeing right now. Uh, I think what is going to be um, really fascinating for me, Rob and, and, and Matt, is – what, what natural guardrails come into play if guys go into the portal and don't get what they're asking for? If, if, if colleges get to the point where they say and will legitimately tell a kid, hey, we're not paying you that, good luck, move on. And that's, some of that's happening now, and I think some kids are overplaying their hand a little bit. How many cycles of that has to happen before – that slows any of it down. And does that ever come about? Does it ever come about that, that kids slow down because they're hearing other guys aren't getting what they thought they were going to get and left some money on the table at the school they were previously at? I just wonder if those natural guardrails are ever going to come into play because I just don't know that a legislative body is ever going to put something into place. That that makes any sense. Yeah, you, but you can call me pessimistic, but I, I think you're always going to see you know guys – you know, looking at what other guys are getting and, and what more for them for themselves, or thinking they can get more somewhere else. And again, you know, may, maybe it does normalize after a time, but I think you're always going to see you know jealousy creep in human nature. Yeah, I think it will normalize a little bit over time, Rob. But I mean, again, I think it, like you said, human nature, right? And it's not just the kids; it's the people around them. Parents they they, they hear this from you know Tane's cousin, and you know, next thing you know. Uh, he he's found out that that Brent has this nil deal, and and in reality, it's it's none of that. But you know that's how it works out there, right? I mean, so and so knows so and so, and then it goes from there, and they've heard this and that, and, and none of that's actually true. Um, and, and I think just by human nature, you'll see some of that continue to happen just because of that. Well, and then I think the other part of this element too is: are there going to be some collectives and some people who tell coaches no? You know, like, hey, that, that's not the going rate for, for what that position is yielding out there. And so you're, you're not going to not going to pay it. We don't we don't have the that that's not in the budget to pay player X, you know, 400 when the value of him is 150. Will somebody actually step in and say that? And will coaches accept that? Because here's the thing with coaches. And I've said this and I'll continue to say this. If they need an extra seventy-five thousand or hundred thousand for the recruiting budget, and they go to their AD at the Power Five level, that AD is going to rubber stamp that, right? If they need an extra analyst, they're they're going to create that position for them. If they need a private jet to get somewhere on forty-five minutes' notice because Player X will take them take a visit in their home at five thirty, they'll find a private jet for them. They don't get told no very often. So, do we get to a point where some guys' bluffs are called, and, and good players walk over over money. Do, do we get to that point where that becomes a legitimate, real thing that, that coaches are willing to do um, in, in time? I think that's another element to the natural guard wa- guardrails. Do those ever really come about or not? Balls by 50 wants to know, will Rick Barnes, he typically starts to shorten his rotation and SEC schedule starts. Um, how do you see him trimming down the rotation over the next few games? Do you think he will mainly go with eight man or fewer rotation or as many as 10 that could see significant minutes, Rob? Well, I mean, you, you got eight that are going to play for sure. I mean, that are guaranteed minutes. I mean, real quick here, Dalton, Adu, J- Josiah, Santiago, Zakai, Jama, Tobe, and, and Jordan Ganey. That's eight guys who are going to play. So to me, you're really talking about the four freshmen. I mean, we're, what are – JP Estrella, Cade Phillips, what are those two guys are going to play? You got to have a third post. Uh, so the decision in December is, you know, do you really, do you choose between one of them or 
is it kind of a platoon who, who's you know who had who's had the better week of practice but one of those two freshman bigs is going to play so you're going to play nine and and to me you know freddie freddie would play for me i would i would figure out a way i mean if that means jordan jordan ganey gets less minutes or you know maybe santiago gets a few less minutes in one of his rotations i would find out a way to make make it work for freddie this year i don't know that this head coach has the patience to live with some of the growing pains that you're going to see from Freddie Dillon. But to me, he, he is pretty clearly one of your most talented players. And, and, and one of your outside of Dalton, I think your most talented scorer as far as a guard, a guy that can, can create his own shot, that can score at all three levels. Again, don't know that this head coach is going to be willing to live with some of the mistakes to, to get him some minutes. And, and Cam Carr, they love Cam Carr. I mean, anytime it, Rick or any other coaches are asked about him, you know, Ray – raving endorsement but i i just i, I don't I, I think minutes are gonna be hard to come by for that guy so long answer they're gonna play those eight guys one of the freshman posts is gonna play so that's nine and then you know where does freddie fit in if 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 you're gonna play freddie then they're gonna have a 10-man rotation if, if he's not gonna get regular minutes and you're looking at nine Let's go to Hoover underscore Vol as a fun one that we can all go around the room for. Um, as the roster stands today, so right now at the time of this recording, um, including current commits, how would you rate Tennessee's position groups heading into the 2024 season on a scale of A to F, grading scale of A to F? So, again, knowing that Tennessee is going to get some guys to the transfer portal, but at the time of this recording, let's go position by position quarterback i mean nico's very unproven but everybody likes what they've seen in him have confidence in him so i mean i would i would go b um you know i'm not gonna give him an a never seen him play but i go b can you feel good about him yeah i mean i i would I'd probably go i would probably go a um just because who you're gonna trade who, who you're trading him for no. who, who would you who would you say i'd rather have that guy i mean Jalen milrow at alabama um i mean how many people i mean carson beck at georgia Okay, I mean, so B plus, A minus at quarterback for me, just based on the talent I've seen from him. That doesn't mean he's not going to have growing pains, but there's not a ton of guys out there I'm trading. I would, I would, I would swap him for right now. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think you'd probably have to knock him a little bit just because of depth. But you know what, what's behind him? But as far I, I'm with Hubbard, I would. If you look around this league, I mean, who you can trade for for Nico? Yeah, B B B plus A minus is probably right. You, including current commits too, right, Eric? Yes. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I think in Jake Merklinger, I think if, if you talk to folks at Tennessee, they feel like they've got a guy that, you know, fits what they want to do from a system standpoint and, and wants to come here and learn and, and understands that Nico's there ahead of him. So I, I think a B plus, A minus is fine. Because, again, who who are you trading Nico for? I'm not sure that you're trading him for anybody, um, you know, outside of a couple. We'll, uh, we'll pick them up, put them down here, going through the rest of these position groups. But uh, running back, um, I would say B because – you like your, you know, what we believe, no right, no small. You like your options in Samson and Selden. Um, maybe depth a little bit's a, a question mark, but I would say B because you like those options there, Brent. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm more I'm more worried about the lack of experience of Cam Selden there than I am Nico's lack of experience at the quarterback position because Cam Selden's a high school wide receiver learning how to play running back. So to me, there's a little more, there's a greater unknown at running back than, than there is – at some other places, um, so that, that's fine. I, I don't, I don't have a huge problem there with that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think there's potential there, big play potential, but I, there's definitely unknowns. At this time, I would go C at wide receiver. Um, again, we, you know, we'll, we'll see ultimately what Brew McCoy decides to do, and I, I guess that could probably change that up to a B. But uh, wanting to bring in a wide receiver, need Dante Thornton to produce, need Webb and Nimrod to take another step. Um, but I would I would probably go I'd, I'd probably go C with that group. Am I off? What do you think, Rob? I mean, I, I think you had, you really hope Mike Matthews can come in and, and, and make an immediate impact. And that's you, you know when Squirrel was able to do it, you know was that a was that a desperation? I mean, did Tennessee just have to have you know somebody? But in that situation, but I I think what I guess my point being, I don't think this offense is just an impediment to having a receiver play it as a freshman. I mean, squirrel was pretty, pretty productive last year. And I, I think if Mike Matthews can come in and be a dude then, then and, you know, Dante can give you something bruise back and, then, you know, you're looking at a pretty good, pretty good court. I, I mean, squirrels, man, I mean, he kind of slips through the cracks. That, that guy's wildly productive. Yeah. I, I think the other question there is what, what is, how does the quarterback play change the receiver production? 
That's no. a good. That's a great, great question. And I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but that that might make a receiving group, a receiving core group look better. I think yeah, Hendon I mean, Hooker. Helped, I think Hendon Hooker helped that group two years ago look a lot better. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, how many, how, how much money did Peyton Manning make? Marcus Nash, you know, yeah. or Joey Kent. I mean, can, yeah. is Nico a guy that is he? Can he make good good players look great? Uh, tight end, I would go F because at the time, right now, <laughs> you're in trouble. So I would go F, but of course, you bring in a, a you know, you bring in a guy through the transfer portal and see what happens. That get a whole lot better, but still, Ethan Davis, you, you like so much, Matt. You, you, everybody likes him. Everybody's excited to see him. I know I'm excited to see him, but again, unproven. And um, you know, at this time, Okoye is probably not ready to help you, and uh, just no bodies at that position. Yeah, no, I mean, I think they love Ethan Davis, but. He's got to stay healthy, and you've got to see him play. Um, you know, so I, I'm with you. I don't see a big, a big reason to go any higher than that. And here's an announcement: they they need Ethan Davis to be next year's James Pierce. That's yeah, that's what they yeah need. yeah for sure. Good point. Good point. Let's group line of scrimmage together, O line, D line, with who has already announced that they're coming back, with who we believe, and AP and Brent have been saying that they you know believe is going to be coming back. Uh, hard not to feel good about that, uh, that that group right there, Brent. Um, you like for some development to happen behind them for sure, but you like those options up there, O line and D line. Well, the D line, I, I would say B plus. Yeah, I mean the D line is super productive. I mean, I, I think there's when you look at the depth of where they are, if, if everybody's back the way it appears to be, you feel like that D line. Uh, there's there's a lot of teams in, in the country where that would take Tennessee's D line. Hard for me not to call them an A, uh, given their production and given yeah. where they were. Um, now somebody's got to take a step, you know, uh, opposite of James Pierce. You need to see more out of Joshua Joseph. Is, is that Caleb Herring? Where, where's that other one coming from with the loss of Tyler Barron and, and the loss of Roman Harrison there? But I mean, their depth on the inside is, is, is why they're not in the portal really looking for anybody, right? Um, on the O line, Matt, you got a lot of experience. You still have the depth concerns that you have. I, again, I don't think they were great but i don't think you have to necessarily be great and then how does the quarterback change them a, a year ago a year from now now i'll say this jalen wright helped that group look a lot better because of the way he broke tackles so that old line's bringing back a lot of things i think they still have some concerns where do those running backs help them out how does the quarterback help them out yeah i agree and i mean i think you know from the depth standpoint you're right eric it, more so on the offensive line is is that where you have to see you're bringing in a, a, a pretty solid offensive line class but again they're freshmen it's the sec you know you you think you have guys that are going to help you in the future but right now i think that that group uh, is probably you know a, a b you love what you have up front coming back but I, I agree with brent i think on the defensive line as productive as that group's been probably hard for me not to go with an a there yeah, I think you need to bring a guard in, too, um, in this transfer portal cycle. And, of course, already looking at one, have one on campus. Uh, yep. Linebacker, good thing Peely's coming back for sure. You like the, some things that some of your young guys did. Uh, need to get better if you're if you're guys like Herring. And, and really, all those guys got to get better. Um, but you got a lot of got a lot of options there. And, of course, Peely coming back, you, you feel much better about that group, Rob. So I, I would give that group probably a, a B-, minus, but you, you, need to, you need to take a step and play better. Yeah, I mean, Pe Beasley's got a tremendous burden. I mean, with with Beasley gone, and I mean, he he's got to be a guy. I mean, he's got to be the dude. But you know, Aaron Carter, tons of potential. I think you had to love what you saw from T. Lander this year. I mean, cer certainly the, the coaching staff, you know, seem all in on, on T. Lander. So you know, as you mentioned, guys have to keep coming on. Peely's got to be the dude. But I mean, in, in, in Carter and, and T. Lander, I, I think you got two second year guys that are going to be dudes. And kind of on that note, we'll, we'll end Hoover Vol here. Secondary, kind of incomplete. <laughs> I mean, we just don't we don't know right now. Um, ultimately, is Wesley Walker on this team in the next fall? Is you know what's Gabe Judy Lolly going to do? I mean, we, we we hear things and we talk about things, but um, a lot of youth, a lot of unproven guys, inexperienced guys in that secondary. So, I mean, if I had to give a grade for the secondary right now, Brent, I mean, I mean, I can't go higher than a C because I just, I just there's a lot of questions there. Well, and, and I, I don't think that that's necessarily those guys' fault. I'm not going to get on the soapbox. I've read yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the GQ's threads about how they're tired of hearing about it. But the fact of the matter is you, you're going to play some guys in your rotation in the secondary in the bowl game that have 10 snaps under their belt this year on defense. So you're incomplete because you don't really know what you have there. 
Um, I mean, Nico's got more experience than those guys have, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's the thing with those guys. I think there's some talent there. How they perform and how they play, I don't know. And so that's why it's hard to give them a, a letter grade at this point because I, I do think there's talent. It's young talent, and it's unproven talent. So we'll see. How many good things can you hear about John Slaughter yet Slaughter played? Right. I mean, listen, no snaps. I, I, I've heard a lot of good things about a lot of players who didn't turn out to be good, who didn't turn out to be productive. I've also heard a lot of things about how guys are bad practice players, and then they get them on the field, and all of a sudden they make a bunch of plays. Yeah. You know, I mean, the proof will be in the pudding, and I think we'll start to see some of that proof January first in Orlando with, with everything that's gone out of that secondary and some of the young guys that are going to have to play by default. Yeah, uh, kind of on that when, note, when talking about the linebackers, Beach Bum wants to know: Is Edwin Smilman the type of linebacker that could come in immediately get some reps, like Arian Carter, Jeremiah T. Lander, to this year? Or is he more of a developmental prospect? Matt, you would know better than anybody, of course. We'll see how he adapts um, You know, once he once he gets in here for camp and everything. But for T-Lander and for Carter, you know, Carter had to play. Had to play. And then T-Lander was forced to have to play. You have more, at this time of this recording, you have more depth at the linebacker position to where Spillman doesn't necessarily have to be thrust in there to action. But I do like his skill set, and I think that he could have some type of role, especially on special teams. No, definitely on special teams yeah. for Evans Philman. But, you know, I think absolutely there's there's more depth right now than there was when those two guys got here. Uh, a big thing for me with Evans Philman is when does he make it to campus? Um, you know, there's some hope that he will be here for spring practice. You know, I hope that he'll be able to graduate in March and do the same thing that Caleb Beasley is doing. Nothing's official on that yet. So we'll see what happens there. I mean, it's important to get that spring under your belt. So I think that helps determine some for him. But yeah, I mean, I, I like his skill set. I think he does a lot of things well, especially in the run fit. Um, any linebacker pretty much coming out of high school ranks has to improve, you know, in what they do in, in the pass fit. So I think that's the biggest thing for him. But I think he can find some reps. How meaningful are they? I don't know. But Tennessee does a lot of different things for those guys. Well, and look at this. I mean, I mean, Elijah Herring had problems in space, played as a freshman in a package. Caleb Perry played as a freshman in a defensive package. Brian Jean-Marie is committed to getting those guys on the field because he wants to keep them engaged in their yep. development. So mm -hmm. I think that's something he does as good a job as anybody, probably the best job of anybody on the staff, at doing that with young players to keep their engagement where it needs to be to further accelerate their development early in their careers. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, Herring had that third down package as a freshman. This year it was Perry who was behind in the rotation to guys like T. Lander and Carter who are younger than him but had that spot on third downs in that package, and he played, you know, 10 snaps a game. So, um, yeah, he is committed to playing young guys. Got a couple here from our, from uh, Orange Grizz 2263. Kind of a state of the union for the following five different uh, areas. I'll kind of go through these. We can go through these quick. Uh, number one, Brent, the athletic department overall, it's in pretty great shape. Can't argue much more with what Danny White's doing with where football is, men's basketball, where baseball is, some of the non-revenue sports. Lady Vols basketball needs to needs to get better right now, but overall athletic department wide, you can't ask for much more. No, I think it, I think it's gone well. I mean, I think he inherited a, a more stable department outside of football than a lot of people want to give him credit for. Uh, I think he's done a good job continuing with that stability. He's made some nice additions in some non-revenue sports that have done some good things. He's obviously upgrading a lot of facilities. Um, I, I think they're on a pretty good heater right now overall. So I, I think things are are going pretty well for Danny White in that athletic department. Football division of the athletic departments, uh, the guys behind the scenes, Matt, the, uh, the the role players, the analysts, guys behind the scene for football. Yeah, I mean, I think those guys have done a really good job. I mean, I think when you look at it, Tennessee's had some some continuity there. there there's been a little bit of turnover. You know, at times, obviously, some, some guys went with Alex Galesh, but I think inside of the scouting department, they've been really good. Um, you know, I think that, for what they have, what they came into, it's been very productive. Rob, the quality of the roster overall, I do think this roster has gotten much better the last couple of years. Still some holes, still not to the likes of Georgia and Alabama, but the quality of the roster top to bottom. It's it's dramatically improved. I mean, yeah. it's not even – I mean, it, but you got to remember the baseline of where we're coming from. I mean, it, oh, yeah. There were, I mean, there were two years – Eric, you might have been in, in junior high, I don't know, but there were – I mean, I think it was – there were two of Butch's years. I think it was 15 and 16 or 16. He had a tight end playing tackle. They didn't They didn't have an NFL draft pick. 
Yeah. I mean, that's incredible. The two year, two consecutive years, Butch didn't have an NFL draft pick off Tennessee's roster. And then, you know, you had a couple of years where you had two guys. I think, you know, Jawan Jennings year, it was him and, and Daryl Taylor. And, and year after that, and my point being, yeah, it's not Georgia, Alabama level, but from where they were, it's, it's night, night and day, light years from where they were five, six years ago. No draft pick draw, but he did have some champions a lot. <laughs> With five star hearts. Yeah. And and those were to be fair, those were probably I mean, that's probably a duly carryover at that point, the, the years I'm talking about. I mean, it was early in Butch's yeah. tenure. Yeah. Uh the last two I'm gonna group together, uh four and five. Big picture recruiting, is it on the upward trajectory and the current recruiting footprint, Matt? Uh you're gonna you're gonna lose some. You need to win some more. Um, but also in like certain positions that we've talked about, it feels like the board just needs to be bigger. Yeah, it feels like the board needs to be bigger um, in terms of recruiting footprint. I'm assuming kind of where he's asking about where Tennessee is recruiting in terms of what states. I, would I think so, yeah. I think they've done a pretty good job, you know, getting and building relationships in North Carolina, Virginia, and Georgia. Those are going to be so important. You're not always going to be able to go to to Texas and California and Florida and and win some of those premier battle. So I think that's historically been a really good footprint for Tennessee. I think they've done a good job of building in those, you know, states, Georgia, especially very talent rich, North Carolina. So I I think, yes, that footprint has certainly expanded, um, you know, over time. And then I think as far as an upward trajectory, yeah, I think Tennessee's on an upward trajectory in terms of recruiting. They have to keep building. They have to keep expanding their board. But they have a really good chance in 2025 to, to have a special class. Look at, you know, those last couple of weekends, some of the guys they got here. You just have to keep, you know, hitting and winning some more of those battles. As AP likes to say, win your fair share. Um, you know, they didn't do that at times this, this cycle. You're going to have another chance to do it in the next cycle. Uh, you, you got to win some of those. Yeah, you know th- this recruiting class right now feels like on the if, to use a golf analogy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be AP here for a minute to use my golf analogy if I can. Rob, it feels like that they went under par on the front side, played really well, right? Shot t- shot two, three, four p- under par on the front, made the turn with a chance to have a career day, ha- have have one of their better career rounds ever, and then on the back side. They three putted a couple different times and they they finished one, you know, they shot one over on the back. And, and all of a sudden now your day where you were going to, you know, shoot 68 became a day where you shot, you know, 72 instead. That That's what this recruiting class feels like to me. Did a lot of good work early when you look at Mike Matthews and some of these guys, but just didn't do anything uh, in the fall, which makes it feel like you just kind of limped home on the backside of your round of golf. Yeah, that's a great analogy. If you want to extend yeah. the AP analogy, Hubbard, it, it's because he got distracted by a 25% off Peter Millar cell <laughs> in the pro shop at, at the turn and just, you know, was flustered when he got in the back nine. H- had I known I was going to use that analogy, I would have much, I would have dressed much better for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been in a vest. All right, couple more here. Let's go to 007 Vol. Strangest but yet most useful Christmas gift that you have ever received. Any anything come to mind for anybody? Strange, but something you look back on like, oh, I'm glad I got that. I've used it a lot. No, I got nothing. Yeah, not not right off the top of my head. I don't, I don't have anything. I got a um one of those like uh, like calendars you put on your desk that's like big and it lays the days out. And I use that sucker every single day. I didn't ask for it, but I got one for 2022 and I used it so much. I asked for one last year and I'm going to ask for one this year. So I would say that or a backpack, but uh, I can't think of anything else. Matt, you got anything? No, my, my great grandma got me a can of shaving cream one time when I was in high school and I felt like at the time it was super strange. You know, my dad then explained it to me, at least in his terms that, you know, it was what she was able to get. She wasn't, you know, financially well off, but every time you use this, you know, you'll think that she got it for you. Obviously I don't shave a ton. I didn't have a, a great beard then, but I, I probably did, you know, think right. of her at least, at least when I used it. So, I mean that I thought at the time it was a strange gift. It made sense down the line, but yeah, I mean, it was my useful grandpa when tried I used to give me it. a shoehorn one time and I said, no, you all know so what a shoehorn is? Yeah, you're so mean. I had a broken hip, man. Are you kidding me? I used a shoehorn for like two months. <laughs> I guess that would make sense. 
with an extent with an extender on it. Are you kidding? If me? somebody would have gotten Hover a shoehorn several years ago, it would have, that would have been his answer. <laughs> that, would, that would have been a very good. Gift. <laughs> it would have come in handy. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, let's go here to. Let's go to um, I Heart Vols. No, let's go here to. Sorry. Nash Falls 94. Do you think going with an inexperienced coach, recruiter, and Alec Avelin was a mistake by Josh Heupel? Uh, potentially going into the season with two true tight ends, not including Okoye, and missing out on all the high school tight end targets seems like a big concern. Yeah, Matt, we, we kind of talked about this a lot over the last couple of weeks. And, and Avelin, of course, is learning and growing on the job. Uh, you know, Kelsey Pope was in that similar situation, uh, but Tennessee does need help at tight end right now. Yeah, Tennessee needs help at tight end right now. There's there's no way to sugarcoat that. It's as Brent said earlier, it's hard in the SEC. It's it's hard. It's a hard conference to recruit, and he's learning on the job as he goes. Um, you know, it, it's tough. I think when you look at Kelsey Pope in year two, it was better for him. Could his board have been bigger? Yeah, his board could have been bigger. But overall, he landed Mike Matthews, he landed Braylon Staley. But when you look back to the last cycle for Kelsey Pope, he landed Nathan Leacock. So it wasn't it wasn't a great first cycle for him, even kind of with what was going on with Tennessee when the offense was clicking at such a productive level. So for Alec Ablin, yeah, I'm sure there's been some humbling learning experiences here along the way. You have to take those and grow from them. All right, I wanted to save I Heart Vols for last because I think it's funny. Um, this is what he has to say. If the VolQuest staff were to individually enter the college team sports media transfer portal, how would you announce it on social media? He throws out some suggestions. Uh, AP posts a picture of pre Hark of the Herald Angels sing Charlie Brown Christmas Tree. My favorite one, Rob, <laughs> Rob goes the, the combo route and posts a picture of the earbuds that came with his iPhone 1 and the empty recliner. <laughs> I'm sure it's a TikTok video with a 50 cent uh, gift followed by three words, guys, it's true. I really just wanted to bring that on here because I thought those were so funny. But anybody want to add anything else? No, if I, if I go into the portal, I'm going to disappear. Um, I will not resurface <laughs> anywhere else. Um, that will my, por my portal entry will be my entry into retirement, and I will not be moonlighting as anything in retirement. When I retire, I will be... I will be off in the vast wasteland that you will not be able to find me um, anytime soon. Man, that, shots, shots that, fired at no, Jimmy Hubs right no, there. No, 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 no. You do whatever you want <laughs> to do. Cover, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. That's I'm, that. just, I'm, I'm just, I'm 100% kidding. kidding. I'm, I'm just saying kidding. when I'm gone, I'm gone. There'll, I'm, be, there'll be tumble. My, mine will be a picture of tumbleweed is what it'll I'm, be. To be clear, vast I'm, wasteland. to be clear, I'm firing shots at Jimmy right there, tongue in cheek, and would, <laughs> would do so if he was in one of these windows. I mean, when I, Brent does retire one day, like we'll never hear from him again. Like legit, that's, that's exactly my fear. Right. Uh, you'll you'll hear from him, but it'll be like you know the the biggest pumpkin at, at the Granger County Fair, <laughs> <laughs> award winning tomatoes. I was gonna say it'd be the biggest tomato at the at the at the tomato fest in June down there. Hey, in Granger don't try County. to pigeonhole. Don't don't pigeonhole him. Don't try. He's not a one trick pony. I'm <laughs> talking, talking about turkey claws. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure, Eric, the only way to actually enter the transfer portal is to get your Hayes Fawcett graphic. I mean, I, I mean, my gosh, it doesn't have – I mean, it's not official if, if you don't have your Hayes Fawcett graphic. So that's, that's how I would That's how I would go in. The only the only thing I know for sure is I'll cap it with respect my decision. That's, yeah. It's the only thing I know for sure. And it will not say one last rodeo. Oh, you got to love the time that we're in right now and no better place to stay up to date on all that is uh, visitors via the transfer portal, finishing off this class of 2024, Tennessee basketball, Tennessee football, getting ready for the Citrus Bowl. We are uh, in a busy, busy month right here and VolQuest.com is on top of it all. Can't thank you enough for sending in your questions and your comments here on the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast. Big thank you to Exterior Home Solutions for uh, making us a part of their priorities um, you've got uh, local trusted since 1999, roof, garage, siding, whatever the case may, de may, may be. Give them a call today at 865-524-5888 or visit them online at exteriorhomesolutions.com. For Rob Lewis, Matt Ray, Brent Hubs, I'm Eric Kane. Thanks so much for listening to us here on the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast.